Thank you, Chris and Diana. Last night they were in here rehearsing their music and stopped by my office and I said, um, I'm not going to do the talk that I had scheduled. I'm going to do a talk on Hanukkah. Got anything Jewish? <laughs> so that's pretty darn good for overnight, right? <laughs> Just pull it out of the, the hat. So, so thank you so much. I played him a CD with a couple of tracks on it. I said, could you learn this overnight? And they said, um, it might take a little bit longer than that. So thank you. Passover, Passover yes. We're going to do Passover in, in March. So, so we'll have a little um, klezmer music for Passover. How are you? Great. Me too. Yeah. I got some exercise this week. You know, a couple of the other people in here got some exercise this week. We got to throw sandbags out there by the river. You, you don't know if there's a river out there, do you? Or some of you do. You say, yeah, I've seen that. Before. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was a river. <laughs> Raging through. Ah, so we are celebrating this month festivals of light. Last week we looked at the Buddha and the, the enlightenment of the Buddha. We looked at uh, Bodhi Day, which was last Monday on the 8th, and, and began to be aware of this celebration of light, this, this ancient celebration of light that we do, that in, as the, the world appears to be a gathering darkness, we remember the truth of the light that is always there, always present. And it's a wonderful spiritual exercise. It's a wonderful, I, you know, I, I call it in the first service, you know, the gym to work out in for our consciousness. Is, is when, it's wonderful to say everything is good when, when our life is going well, right? Life is good when it's all happening and flowing and we're happy. It's another thing to say life is good when, if we look at the events and the circumstances around us, they're beginning to look a little dark. But to realize and to remember the truth, that life is so good. And so this is the exercise we get to do with light right now. We get to remember that light is the truth of who we are. It's the truth of the universe. The very first thing in the Hebrew Bible that God says is, let there be light. First thing. In the seven main aspects of God, we're going to play with that at the Christmas Eve service. The, the second aspect of God after life is light. And so we remember this. And if it's the truth of God, guess who else it's the truth of? Us. Us. So we are light, even in what looks like darkness. We are the goodness, even in what looks like challenging circumstances. So have you noticed that if you look around the world today, that, that you know, if you're paying attention to the news especially, some things might look a little dim? dark, you know, challenging. But we get to stand in that consciousness and say, that may be what it looks like, that may be the outer appearance, that may be the events, but I'm going to stand in the spiritual truth of knowing who and what is really real and who and what I am. I am light. And that light exists despite what looks like what's going on. That's the mind of light that Sri Aurobindo talks about. Sri Aurobindo was a, a Hindu mystic that uh, Ernest Holmes studied a lot in the, in the later part of his life. Was, uh, he was a big influence, he was a big inspiration for him. And, and I love his work. It's not, it's not easy reading. It's, it's um, uh, sometimes uh, very challenging, but it, but it really is, is. I love this idea of we are the mind of light. We are stepping into that. Not the mind of ignorance, that which ignores the truth, but we are that which becomes aware of the light. So we are playing with that this season. We are playing with remembering that as our truth. We are light. You're light. I'm light. We are light. And we stand this mind of light. So this week we're going to look at, at a wonderful, oh, I'm sorry, I have an Emerson quote there. It also reminds us of that when we're, when we're wrapped up in circumstances. Emerson, one of my favorite Emerson quotes, we, on the human level, strive and struggle while the infinite lies in smiling repose. Isn't that a great quote? There's a, and the infinite is not separate from us, not in his mind. It's, 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 there's that aspect of us. Have, have you ever noticed that you know, maybe sometime you, you catch yourself and stuff is going on, stuff is going on, and all of a sudden you take a moment and you get centered and you realize that there's a part of you inside 
that's just calm and happy and content and not being caught up in the raging river that's running by? You ever? Yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> One person besides me has. Okay. Anybody? Oh, good. Okay. All right. Whew. <laughs> so Hanukkah begins this, this coming Tuesday uh, at sundown. And Hanukkah is literally called the Festival of Lights. And so it's, it's, it's a wonderful place to, to and a wonderful uh, story to look at as a metaphor for ourselves. And so the story of Hanukkah, which is our story, it's a soul story. Whether it's factual or not is irrelevant. It's a soul story. It has stuck around for these what is it, 2,200, 2,300 years since it actually happened, is stuck around because it is a story that speaks to our soul. So, as so often happens, the Hebrew people, the Israelites, were, had somebody else occupying their land. You've heard this story before, right? Yeah. You know? I mean, this is... This, one, of my, one of my Bible teachers one time said, you know, the Bible is the only book written from the standpoint of the loser. <laughs> They lost almost every war they ever fought, except a few of the early ones they won. But they lost almost every war. They were, you know, they were on the plains in between Egypt, superpower, and all of the Persian you know, Gulf, whoever was rising up in power, and the Romans and the Greeks and all that stuff. And they're in the middle of this little process that when they're going to do battle with each other, they come through Israel and conquer it. Boom, boom, boom. I remember, um, I think it was Tchaikovsky who, who described Poland as being the same way, sitting between Russia and Germany, you know, and it's this little land that gets, you know, if they're going to go to war with each other, they go through Poland, you know, and the Polish people have been, you know, run through, you know, so many times. So Israel is kind of like that. They're, they're, they're the Polacks of the Middle East, if you will. I don't know if that's politically correct to say, but it's the truth. So, so a group that at the time was known as the Seleucides, Sel Seleucides, Seleucids, excuse me, um, which were occupied Syria, were from Syria, were occupying the Holy Land at that time. A rabbi friend of mine said one time that this was the shame that the Jewish people don't like to talk about at Hanukkah. And the shame was they didn't get conquered. They invited these guys in. There were two little groups in, in there. There were the, the kind of Greek influence, they called them Hellenized Jews, and the more fundamental traditional Jews. And the way that I view that in, in this metaphysical story, this metaphorical story, is the fundamental Jews are those who stuck to the core. You know, you, there's a part of us that's always sticks to our core, our spiritual core, and says, I'm going to do what is right by mine to do, by what my soul calls for me to do. The Hellenized Jews represent that part of us that wants to get along out here in the world, and so it starts dancing around and doing things and manipulating and, and maneuvering, and yeah, well, you, know, you want me to jump how high, right? Anybody besides me, you, you've known people like that, right? I know nobody here has ever been like that, but you've known people like that. You've got a cousin somewhere. Okay? And so that's what, what they were. And so these two groups were kind of at civil war with each other, and the Hellenized Jews said, well, you know, we're going to invite the local superpower in to help us out. That's happened before and happened since, right? You know, you've kind of noticed in the world that you know, some little area gets in trouble and they invite the Russians, the Chinese, or the Americans in, right? We've heard this story before. So that's what they did. They invited the local superpower in. And these, these were these guys. And like all local superpowers, then and now, once they came in, it was really hard to get them to leave. <laughs> and so, and not only was it hard to get them to leave, they don't respect the culture. So they come in and they take over the temple. And the temple is the, the sacred center of the Jewish culture. It's the place where they go to have their, their deepest most innermost experience with the divine, with God. It's the place where, in, in this culture, God actually lives and, 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 and communes with them in the temple. Each of us has a temple within us, don't we? A sacred temple where we commune with the divine. We have that within us already. And so, these guys had come in, and because they were from the Greek influence, they had erected a statue of Zeus, a false god sitting in the middle of the temple. They were sacrificing pigs, to the God, and you know how the Jews feel about pigs, and, and all this stuff, so they desecrated the temple. And so eventually, of course, the Jewish people were not happy about that. 
Some of them. The Hellenized Jews, they would just put up with it. It's like, well, it's just part of the process, and it's part of the price we paid. And, you know, but the fundamentalists said, uh-uh, not, not us. This is not where we're going to go. So they've, they've desecrated that temple. How many of you know what it's like to have your temple trashed? Your inner self trashed? Okay? I think we probably all have done it at some point in time because we get so occupied in the stuff out here that we totally forget and ignore our own inner self. And so pretty soon we get in there and we find out, ooh, you know, it's kind of messy in there. You know, anybody that's done any deep inner work, you know, it's kind of, you know, the first thing you do is you find out how messy it is in there. You know, it's, it's, you think you come to a spiritual church and you want to, it's going to be all love and light. And then, you know, if you actually start to do any work, it's like, oh, God, you know. <laughs> so that's what they found. The temple had been trashed. They're separate from their center. And so a priestly family known as the Maccabees comes up and says, you know what, we've had enough of this. Each of us has a Maccabees living within us. Each of us has that part of us, but when we get off center, finally says, you know what, I'm too far off center, I'm coming back. In, in the story of the prodigal son that Jesus talks about, this, it says the son comes to himself. When he's out in the farthest land, slopping pigs, there's a moment where he comes to himself. There's a moment where we come to ourselves. And this is what the Maccabees family is. Judas Maccabee, his nickname was the Hammer of God. The, the, the word Maccabees literally means hammer. And he was known as the Hammer of God. That's a pretty powerful name. You know, last week we were talking about the Buddha. The Buddha names his kid the chain or the fetter. You know, the ball and chain is my kid, the, the chain, you know. This guy is the Hammer of God. I'll take that name anytime rather than, you know, that. And so he and his family decide, we're going to kick these guys out of here. Now, they're vastly outnumbered. This is a modern army. This is, you know, you know they've got all this stuff. But they decide to, but they, they know one thing. They know that they're fighting with God on their side. They're fighting in alignment with truth. When we stand in alignment with truth, Ernest Holmes has a wonderful quote that says, God plus one is a majority. When we align with our God self, God plus us in alignment with it is a majority. And we can do amazing things when we do that. So that's what they start to do. They start to do amazing things. They start to do guerrilla warfare against these guys, and finally they pest them so much that the troops leave. Now what their intention is, is to go back to their kingdom and get more troops and come back and really squash these guys. But what happens is they leave, the ruler of the whole dynasty dies, a new one is trying to arise. There's this whole stuff that goes on in their own land. And so the troops get called back and said, no, you're not going to Israel. You're going to stay here and deal with the unrest that's happening here. And they never come back. You couldn't have planned that out ahead of time, by the way, right? right. You ever had that where you can't plan it out ahead of time, but it happens anyways, and you're sitting there going, oh, my goodness, thank you, God. Anybody? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's what happens. They finally kick them out. They get back into the temple. They find it, of course, a mess. And so they clean it up. And in the temple is the sacred light, the sacred lamp that they want to light. That's the lamp of God, the lamp that, that's the, the, the connection with God. It's our light within. Each of us has a lamp within that is our connection with God. Just be aware of that for a moment. Find that within you. There's a problem. The lamp takes the sacred oil. It takes a, a, a sanctified oil, and the process to make the sanctified oil takes eight days. And they find out when they go through the stores that there is only one bottle of that oil left, and it's just enough to keep the lamp going for one day and one day only. <coughs> so they do the practical thing, and they just say, well, we won't light it for a while, we'll just wait. That was the story. Did I get that story wrong? No, actually, I think what they did... <laughs> See, the Maccabees, in case you might have found out, they're, 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 uh, they're like what I call Nike guys. And no, Luke, I'm really not making a, re a reference to the University of Oregon. I'm just referring to Nike's motto. They're a just do it kind of guy. We want these Syrians out of here, just do it. We want to clean up the temple, just do it. We want the light reestablished in the temple. Just do it. Just do it. And so they light the light. Now, practical wisdom says this thing is going to die in a day. 
How many of us have lived in practical wisdom where it looks like whatever it is is going to die in a day or it's not going to work out or whatever? Yeah. My hand's up too. (laughs) And of course the Hanukkah story says that the light lasted, the oil lasted for eight days. That one bottle of oil supplied enough light for the eight-day process to sanctify the rest of the oil. Now the oil is a metaphor. There's a couple places in the Bible where oil is, is often used. And one of the other wonderful stories that we'll talk about sometime is, is Elisha comes to a widow who says, I'm, you know, I'm basically you know, at wit's end. I don't have enough. And he says, what do you have? And, he says, and she says, well, I just have you know, one little bottle of oil. And he says, go out and get all the jugs from all your neighbors, bring them in and, and close your doors and go pour the bottle of oil that you have in, into all those jugs. That makes no sense. I got this little jug of oil, and I'm going to pour all that into a bunch of big jugs. But she starts pouring, and of course the story is the oil keeps pouring and pouring and pouring until all the jugs are full, and she can go sell the oil. The oil is our life energy. The oil is our life energy. Am I willing to give my life energy, even when it looks like it might not work out? Am I willing to stand and be and express that life energy that I am in order to light the light of who I am here to be in order to broadcast that out into the world no matter how dark or how impractical it seems? Am I willing to do that? Yes. Yeah. 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 And that is the question that this, this holiday challenges us with if we'll listen to it. Take a breath with me. Am I willing to open up? Am I willing to rep to be aware that my life energy is enough. Because my life energy isn't just my personal life energy. It's the energy of the infinite that is flowing through me. Am I willing to let it flow? Am I willing to let it light up my life and the world? And so we start to to work with that. And that's what they did. They allowed it to to have that light, to rekindle the light in the temple. They allowed it to continue to glow, to continue to light this this temple up, to continue to stand for the, the power of God for the people. And of course it stayed lit for the whole eight days. The the menorah, the the candle that's used to celebrate this holiday in, in Jewish homes has eight candles plus a, a, an additional one. And the reason, there's a couple of reasons for that. The, the center one is oftentimes used to light the other candles. And so on the first day at sundown of, um, of Hanukkah, you would light one candle. The next day you would light two candles. The next day three candles and so on. And the central candle is used for that. There's another purpose for the central candle, and that is there's been that the, the invitation with the menorah is to not use it to light the house but to light the soul. It's not meant to be used for practical walking around with a a candlestick like you normally would to light your way. It's meant to remind people of this miracle. It's meant to remind the people of the constant flowing of the divine within. And so this light here is, in case you do need a light to find your way in the dark, that's what the central candle is also for. So it's a, it's a two-purpose candle. The Jewish holidays, have you ever noticed, they have a practical aspect to them. You know, there's always a little practical stuff going on. You know? And so that's what, that's what that is. That's what that candle is. It's the practical. If you do need a light, here it is. You, know, you don't have to go looking for another one. And so there's this wonderful you know, eight-day process that happens at sunset each day, sundown each day, where you light the candles and you leave them lit for about a half an hour. There's prayers that are said. There's some wonderful food that is served, great music and and stuff like that. It's a reminder for us to let that which inspires us light not the world, the practical world of our lives, but to light our souls. So many times we try and take a teaching like this and it works in the outer world, but we forget to let it illumine our souls, don't we? Sometimes. Maybe other people, not you guys. <laughs> but we remember first to light our souls, and out of the light of our souls grows everything else. This is what Jesus would later say when he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all else shall be added. 
it asks the question, do we, ask, do we wait for everything to be perfect? Do we wait in our lives for our ducks to be in a row? <laughs> for everything to be in alignment? There are football metaphors happening here. That was an Oregon duck joke. That one was an Oregon duck joke, but it actually is, is the metaphor too. Do we wait for everything to be al in alignment? Do we wait for everything to be perfect before we proceed forward? Or do we have that Maccabee energy within us, that hammer of God energy within us, that we say, you know what? I'm getting outside of my staid, normal, practical self of how it always should be, of trying to please everybody, of trying to work with the circumstances. Anybody know what I'm... You've, you've known people like this. And am I willing to go forward anyways? Yes. Am I willing to get impractical, but deeply spiritual? So notice they weren't being impractical from a, just a silly point of view. They were in alignment with their centered truth first. And then from that, they go forward. Okay? And so it's taking that time to remember to send, spend time in our temple and get in alignment with the truth first before we move out. The miracle of Hanukkah is happening every day. It's not just a, something that happened 2,200 years ago. It's happening every day. That life energy, that light, is present right here, right now, in, through, and as each of you, in, through, and as each of us. Okay? And so do we allow ourselves to take part in that miracle? See, if they had never lit the candle, no miracle would have ever happened. Are we willing to open our lives to what seems miraculous? And miraculous simply is that which doesn't make common, normal, practical sense. When we open ourselves up to something bigger than the everyday practical normal. Okay. And so are we willing to allow that miracle to happen? Are we willing to give room for that miracle to happen? Are we willing to give room for spirit to go to work? You know, it's, it's one of the things that, that um, my, my friend Reverend Kathy Ann Lewis, uh, who, who started the intentions retreats that I first started going to uh, when I was just a young religious scientist. Um, that's a joke. Uh, <laughs> I was old when I hit religious science anyway, so I'm just an older religious scientist now. But when I was a new religious scientist, she invited us to set what she called BEHIVES. And it was an acronym, Big, Hairy, Audacious Intentions. Okay? Mary Morrissey in the Prosperity Plus program invite, says if you're not doing a goal that doesn't scare you, you're not dreaming big enough. That's why I'm here, by the way. I had a mentor named Reverend Andrea who was sharing a bowl of mussels with me one night, and I said, I'm going to apply for the minister for the Eureka Church, and she looks at me and she goes, you need to think bigger. Think Reading. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with the Eureka Church. But I had already done 25 to 30 person church. I didn't need to do a 35 to 45 person church. She said, you're ready for a big step. And you know what? It scared me. I'm sitting there going, are you sure? She goes, I know your background. Yes, you're ready. And that's when I called up you know, Reverend Mary, or emailed Reverend Mary, and, and said, um, Andrea says the church is actually still has an open pulpit, but it's not showing anywhere. See, Practical Wisdom said this church wasn't open. The official circumstances said that. And I emailed Mary, and she said, oh yeah, we're open. <laughs> Come on down. When we set a powerful intention, when we open to spirit, when we, when we get centered in our temple and allow that light to start to flow, it shifts everything in our lives. It shifts everything in our lives. It's funny because the, the, some of the processes out of this intention retreat that I'm doing in next month, we did in, in a minister's ongoing education conference in July a year ago when I was up in, in Seattle. Kathy Ann ran, uh, ran the ministers that were there, about 25 of us, through a three-day intention retreat in a matter of six hours. Eyes were rolled back, steam was coming out of our ears, but stuff happened and moved. And, and I was laughing because you know, I, I realized that the day that I was being installed was literally one year to the day from the time that I completed that, that, that minister's ongoing education conference. That I got that clear on my intention that I knew I was going into bigger ministry than I was. Okay? That's how this works. When you get clear, 
See, the Maccabees were clear. They weren't going to mess around. They were clear. When you get clear on your intention, when you get clear on your alignment with spirit and who you truly are, you light up the whole world and you light up your life. Okay? And so that's my invitation. This week, three things. The usual three things, right? <laughs> Number one, be aware of where the light is. There's so much that wants to convince us that it's, it's dark. Look at the news. Look at this. Look at that. Be aware of the light. A friend of mine wrote a song one time that was called A Hundred Good Deeds. And the basic gist of the song was that on any day that the news is broadcasting, oh, look at this tragedy, there are a hundred good things that have happened that day, been, been done. The probably the truth is there's a thousand good things, but she, you know, called it a hundred good deeds because it rhymed better. <laughs> Where do I see spirit operating? When I'm looking at my life, when I'm looking at the world, where do I actually see spirit operating? We teach that what you put your attention on increases. So if I put my attention on what's not working in the darkness, guess what? That's what I'm going to see more of in my life. If I put my attention on the light and what is working, guess what? That's going to be more of the experience I have in my life. Which wolf do you want to feed, as the Native Americans say? Number two, so number one is be aware of the light in your own life. Number two is ask, what have I been avoiding? What have I been not doing because it seems impossible? What is it that I've been putting off and not doing because it seems impossible? Another way I like to ask this question is, where have I been limiting the unlimited? We are conduits, we are expressions, we are manifestations of an unlimited infinite power and presence. Nudge the person next to you and say, you are a manifestation of the unlimited. If you don't have anybody next to you, just, just nudge the person that's right there in your chair. Give, them a, give yourself a little elbow poke and say, you are a manifestation of the unlimited. Okay? Where have I been limiting the unlimited in my life that I know it's time to take the, the, the cap off and let it flow? It's time to light the candle and let it burn. And then the third thing this week, be willing to have spirit work through you. Be willing. I said, I've always said that all we need to do is open the door a crack, just to have a willingness, or a willingness to be willing, or even a willingness to be willing to be willing. <laughs> the tiniest little crack, and spirit can come through and start operating. If we keep the door closed, if we never invite spirit in, if we don't go into the temple, if we say, ah, oh, you know, the Syrians are so much more powerful than us, I'm not going to bother. Why bother? Why light this candle? There's not enough oil. <laughs> Motivational speaker Dennis Waitley used to carry around a news clipping. It said, world about to go dark. Whale blubber supply running out. <laughs> it's from the 1880s, London. Do we keep the light on? Am I willing to have spirit work through me? And so that's the invitation this week. See the light. See it where it's operating in your life. Ask yourself what you're afraid of and where would you like to take the lid off of the, the unlimited and allow it to flow. And then finally be willing to let spirit work through you. Are we good with that? Yes. Great. There's a wonderful prayer that, that um, during the Hanukkah, the lighting of the candle each day, the first, uh, the first day there are three uh, prayers, three blessings that are said, and the rest of it, there are two blessings that are said, and they all begin with this wonderful thing. I'm going to attempt Hebrew, okay? Please be forgiving. For, do I have anybody here who's a Hebrew expert? Uh, okay, a little bit, maybe. Baruch Atah Adonai Elhoneh, Elhoehim, Eloheinu. Let's try that again. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu. And what it means is, blessed are you, Lord God, our King, ruler of the universe. Each of us has and is one of the Lord God, our King, ruler of the universe. There is that within you. It's not some guy up in the sky up there. It's not some, something out there. You're it. Tag. <laughs> You're it. I'm it. We're all it. There's a wonderful uh, gospel song that says, My God is an awesome God. 
My God is an awesome God. It reigns through the universe. Okay? That is what we're playing with. That is who we are. Are we willing to open up and let that play with us? Are we willing to be swept away? You know, it, it was amazing to me watching this thing go from a dry creek bed to this raging, you know, high river. And that's the way spirit is. If we open the door, it will come in as a wonderful flow of light, of love, of energy that moves us into places where we've never thought we would before. We now have a whole bunch of new rock for our gardens out there that have been <laughs> carried from somewhere else downstream. And a nice little pile that I know that Roy was saving up has been gone downstream to bless somebody else. The giving and the receiving of the universe you know, continues to work all the time. Are we willing to let that light shine? Are we willing to let our light shine? Yes. So that is my invitation to you this week. Let your light shine. Let's pray. I'll wait for Judy to come on up and let her light shine. I need a light. <laughs> you are the light. Let there be light. Let there be light. Thank you. And there is. There's always light. Ah, and so in that light, in that consciousness, we are aware of there is an infinite light, an infinite presence, an infinite good that is indeed, and in fact, all that there is, unlimited in its, op in its opulence, in its magnificence, in its operation, in its beingness. Vastly more intelligent than anything we can ever think of. That that infinite presence is all that there is everywhere present. Present in every single microbe, microcosm and macrocosm of this universe. That infinite one is all there is. And whether we call it God, whether we call it Adonai, whether we call it the Tao, whether we call it the Buddha mind, whether we call it Allah, whether we call it Christ consciousness, it is all that there is. It is that which is beyond all the names and includes all the names. And because it is all that there is, because that is the only thing there is that you and I, each of us is, must, can only be one of this infinite presence, there is nowhere else to be. There is nothing else that exists outside of an infinite oneness. And so I speak my word that we remember this truth of ourselves. We remember that we are the life. We are the light. We are the beauty. We are the wisdom. We are all of that. Far greater than we have ever let ourselves believe before. Far beyond our imaginations. We are that. And so we say yes to this infinite presence. We say yes to this beautiful power that simply wants to express its true nature of love, of peace, of glory of prosperity, of creativity, of every single aspect of the divine, all it is doing is saying, will you let me through? And we say yes. In our heart of hearts, in our deepest place, we say yes. In the temple of the divine, we say yes. We clean up our act. We clean up our temple. We light our candles. We remember the truth of who we are. We are the life. We are the light. And allow that to express powerfully, beautifully, everywhere in our lives. We don't have to figure out the how. We simply say yes to that which knows the how. And so in great gratitude for the beauty that is expressed by each of us, and collectively as all of us. And the great gratitude for the light that is always on. No matter how dark these events and the circumstances may seem, that light, that infinite one is always lit, always present. And so in great gratitude for that and how it operates in through and as our lives, how it blesses each of us. I release this word into the law that moves it into form and experience manifestation, full manifestation in each of our lives right here and right now. We simply say yes to that presence. We let it be. We let it do its thing and it does so in our lives. Always for its highest and greatest good, for our highest and greatest good. And it is so. And together we say, and so it is. Thank you.